Yeah, my name is Natasha Duquette, and I serve as an associate professor of English and also associate dean at Tyndale University College and Seminary, which is in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. My book is called Veiled Intent, Dissenting Women's Aesthetic Approach to Biblical Interpretation. And the book asks the question of how 18th century women were able to get their biblical exegesis into print in a time in history where women were not encouraged to be biblical scholars or certainly not really preaching, some Quaker women, but um, that was the exception. And so uh, another researcher asked me at one point, I was writing about Anna Barbald for something called the Handbook of Women Biblical Interpreters. And it was a researcher who works mainly on 19th century women writers, and she said, how were these women in the 18th century even able to get their biblical interpretation into print? And I realized it's because they were writing in genres that were deemed appropriate for women, like uh, devotional poetry, lyric poetry, uh, handbooks of education for children, and devotional texts for children. But they put really meaty biblical interpretation within those forms. So my dissertation was not on biblical interpretation at all, but it was on a topic connected to biblical interpretation in the 18th century, which is the idea of the sublime in poetry. Um, a man named Bishop Robert Loth wrote a book on the sacred poetry of the Hebrews, which in, within which he talks about the sublimity of the Psalms, the sublime in Isaiah. Another person, Edmund Burke, wrote a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful. And the question of my dissertation was, how were women depicting the sublime in their poetry with feminine imagery? Because Burke very much said, the sublime is about power, terror, might, and it's masculine. The beautiful is about femininity, kindness, softness maternity and he kept the two separate but I found women had feminine imagery of sublime power and awe in their poetry so that was my topic and by looking at their poetry and looking into the sources for their ideas of the sublime I hit the Psalms I hit Isaiah I read Bishop Robert Lowe's lectures on the sacred poetry of the Hebrews and then um, at one point while I was a graduate student, I found a psalm paraphrase of Psalm 74. So it has um, verses from Psalm 74 and then poetic paraphrase and um, elaboration on the psalm. I showed it to a friend of mine who's, who was a history doctoral student, and she said, that woman is doing exegesis. So again, I have to credit um, this friend of mine who recognized it. She came from a reformed background. She saw it as a kind of sermon in poetry, what Helen, Helen Rye Williams was doing with Psalm 74, whereas I had been looking at it more for the aesthetic merit. I wasn't thinking about biblical interpretation at that time. But it seemed to empower my friend, the female history major, when she said she's doing biblical exegesis. <laughs> yes. And so I, and then I started understanding that people were really interested in that topic. Yeah. So the best way to start answering the question of how the women were veiling their biblical exegesis is with another poem by a woman, a dissenting woman from the 18th century, Anna Barbald. She has a poem slash hymn called Ye Are the Salt of the Earth, where she takes uh, Matthew 5, 13 to 16, and she starts with Ye Are the Salt of the Earth. And... Um, the latter part of that section of scripture says, so let your good deeds shine before men. And what Anna Barbal does is she asks, what does that mean? You are the salt and light, so your good deeds should shine before men. And she says, um, those who are the salt of the earth, you find them in prisons. You find them beside the beds of people who are dying. You find them binding up wounds of the injured. You find them praying for peace during times of war. So I see her really exegeting that verse and um, answering the question, what does it mean for your deeds to shine forth before others? I think it's really interesting because we often quote you are salt and light in isolation, and we forget that second part, so let your good deeds shine forth. Um, okay, so if she had published a sermon with the title, you are the, salt, you are the Salt of the Earth, or a book, it would have been harder for her to publish that, but because she publishes it as uh, lyric poetry for print, uh, it's a hymn for print. This is the other thing, not a hymn to be sung out in a church, but it was eventually taken up um, by an American 
and published in Boston in a hymnal called Songs of the Free. But in England, she's veiling, she's, this is an American English difference a little bit. She's veiling it, writing this as a poem for print initially, but um, in ballad form, which is a sung form, a printed ballad, um, like William Wordsworth's lyrical ballads. So, okay, so she's veiling it. It's another woman in my book, Joanna Bailey, she wrote plays this way, and she wrote them, She it's called Closet Drama, plays to be read, not to be performed on the stage. It's the same kind of thing as a hymn that was written for print to kind of be embedded in a collection or embedded in a journal, but veiled by the um, context around it rather than sung out. It's interesting with that him that an American noticed it and published it later on in the 19th century in a collection called Songs for the Free. It was a collection of anti-slavery uh, hymns and poetry. Okay, so that's one example of veiling. There's also people like Marianne Schimmelpenning. She's more early 19th century, but she was definitely inspired by the 18th century women. She wrote a book called Biblical Fragments, and even her title is veiling the um, heft of her biblical exegesis because she says in the prefatory essay, these are just some jottings from the margins of my Bible that I've gathered together into a book, and that's why she's calling it Biblical Fragments. But she's um, quoting from St. Jerome. She's citing uh, St. Augustine in Latin. She's using her knowledge of Hebrew to correct the King James Bible in the titles of the Psalms. And so there's this is um, not just small jottings in the, but she's, she's presenting it that way. Uh, you know, they're, they're being modest and they're being self-conscious as women who are doing, doing biblical interpretation. She also veils her work, Biblical Fragments, by saying, um, this is a book to teach mothers how to share biblical truth with their daughters. So she's presenting it as a manual for um, children's education, almost like to what today would be like a Sunday school curriculum manual, but you don't usually have uh, St. Augustine in Latin in a Sunday school um, lesson. So she's got, she's not hiding her learning once you're in the midst of the book, but she hides it I'll stick with the word veils it. She veils it with her prefatory essay, saying these are just a few um, marginal, marginal notes from my own Bible that might help a mother share um, the truth of Scripture with her daughter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to come back to the idea of the sublime and seeing the sublime in the Psalms. So for Edmund Burke, the sublime was about strength and force, something like a storm at sea would be sublime. Um, and then what Joanna Bailey and Anna Barbold and also African-American poet named Phyllis Wheatley, who's in my book, what they show is strength in stillness. And um, they do this through their biblical exegesis. So Bailey has a psalm paraphrase of um, Psalm 93. This is more early 19th century, but she says in her paraphrase, an interpretation of Psalm 93, yes, we see God's power in the storm or the earthquake, um, but we see his strength even more so when he can still the storm. And then she's, she is alluding to Jesus stilling the storm um, on the sea. And then uh, Phyllis Wheatley, she has a paraphrase of Isaiah 63, where um, she has an image of um, Zion, it's the personification daughter Zion, resting on the breast of her Redeemer still, and Phil Sweetly says, looking at her foe, smiling at her foes. And Phil Sweetly created that image while she was still a slave. And so um, the women are coming out with this idea of spiritual strength and stillness that's not as much there in the men's writing at the time. What this has to do with veiling, maybe something about patience. Uh, like the idea of be still and know that I am God, and if they created this biblical interpretation and were patient that someday it would come to light. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I think I would have stopped there. Yeah, yeah, strength and stillness is something I was thinking about. Okay, so how are the women paving a way for uh, social activism even is the is an interesting question. Um, but I have to go back to the Quakers again because um, the Quakers were involved in anti-slavery uh, activism or um, 
consciousness raising even in the early 18th century. So in England, already the Quakers were doing this kind of work. Um, then uh, Marianne Schimmelpenning, who's in my book, she was raised in a Quaker home. So this is what is informing her own anti-slavery. She wrote um, letters for the anti-slavery movement as well as writing biblical interpretation. Uh, Phyllis Wheatley, herself a slave, um, publishing poetry in 1773. Um, Wheatley lived in Boston, then she went to London to publish her poetry. So rather than first saying that social action came out of their biblical interpretation, I would say their biblical interpretation was first informed by early social action by people like the Quakers in the early 18th century. Um, but Wheatley, okay, Phyllis Wheatley, her poems on various subjects, religious and moral, um, she is starting to write them in Boston. She's not finding a Boston publisher, so she actually traveled across the Atlantic to London. She sees her poems into print in London, and then the British, in reviewing these poems, then discover she's a slave when she wrote her poetry. And so the British reviewers are saying, how could a woman of such genius be held in the bondage of slavery? So her poetry actually first led to her own release from slavery. Phyllis Wheatley, wrote later after she was no longer a slave she wrote to an indigenous uh, pastor named Samuel Ockham she said um, you cannot have religious liberty without having legal or political liberty but she didn't write that until she actually had that legal uh, liberty herself okay so I'm telling this Wheatley story because her poetry actually led to her own her own freedom and then her ability to speak to freedom for her fellow African Americans. Um, Anna Barbold's poem, E.R. the Salt of the Earth, was eventually published in this American hymnal, Songs of the Free, um, in the 1830s. And then that would lead into the American anti-slavery uh, movement. But um, it's important to know the dates. So England, slave trade abolished uh, 1807. Slavery in the British colonies abolished 1833. And then later in the... Um, so it's, um, it is the women's writing that is speaking into the British anti-slavery movement, which would affect the American. But it's also the whole British culture is, is a little bit... Um, a little bit ahead of the United States on, on this <laughs> this one form of freedom. And that's why Phil Sweetley's poetry was published in London. There, there was a venue for her voice, for her biblical interpretation. I do want to talk about her poem, Goliath of Gath. So she has a poem about David and Goliath where she, um, she says, uh, small is your tribe, but valiant is your fight. And she's talking about David fighting Goliath, but I feel like she's really identifying with David. She was a, a young woman kind of fighting for the freedom of her people against this huge oppressor, which would be um, the system of slavery that she was caught in herself as she wrote that poem. Yeah, okay. <laughs>